Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to uh, present at least me one of the projects I mean, which I'm, I'm trying to pursue I mean, within MCQSD. Uh, and that actually refers to spin glass physics. Um, and I would like to give sort of an overview. Mm -hmm. So let me start I mean, from the very beginning, not assuming I mean, that uh, you know anything about spin glasses. So what are spin glasses? So first and foremost, I mean, they are magnetic materials, more precisely alloys I mean, like copper mangane, in which the magnetic moments um, interact distant dependently in an anti or ferromagnetic way. And both ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic interactions are, are present. A feature uh, of these materials is a low temperature freezing transition in which these atomic magnetic moments align and they freeze in a random way, actually creating an agotic um, and actually agodicity breaking uh, type of order. Um, so this has been known and understood before more than 50 years in physics. Um, and in my view graph, we have just reminded you of, of very old uh, measurements of, for example, with the uh, magnetic susceptibility versus temperature, which in these spin glasses exhibit a cusp uh, like phenomena and, and memory phenomena. And the cusp is always at the freezing temperature. So, what is in fact all the excitement about beyond studying um, an obscure group of metals? Um, so the study of these agodicity breaking order, which I'm trying to describe, became in fact a parad paradigm uh, for many other areas uh, in physics, ranging from particle physics, but also ranging beyond physics into computer science. So let me describe this. So for the description of the above mentioned freezing uh, for this low temperature phase, uh, it was Sherrington and Kirkpatrick who, um, very early on, came actually up with a simple mean field model, uh, which to simplify things even further, treats these magnetic moments as Ising spins, having each uh, value plus or minus one. And uh, the mean field uh, in these mean field models, of course, refers to the usual thing that namely all of these different n Ising spins interact with every other Ising spin. Uh, but the interaction between those spins is now taken random. Um, and it's completely at random in the sense I mean, that we take these couplings gij to be independent uh, with a standard Gaussian distribution. And whenever you see kind of this curly E in my talk, I'm referring actually to the probabilistic average uh, taken. Sorry, Simone. Just to ask you, uh, are you showing the uh, something in particular of your slides? Because we only see the, the first slide. Oh God, Ooh, that's a bit of a problem. Uh, sorry. Um, all right. Um, that is indeed a bit of a problem. Um, so let me see, let me somehow get this worked and we will... Okay, good. Does that, does that show? Yeah, now no, we should right now we see something different. So ah yes, now 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 it now it sees. Okay, so um so I was I mean, just describing I mean, sort of I mean, this this particular mean field model I mean, of, of Sherrington and Kirkpatrick type, um, which is kind of the usual model I mean, you should know. I mean, there are these interactions which are taken completely at random, a Gaussian distributed. The important thing is it's random, and these interactions take both ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic signs. Now, what, what is a characterizing features, feature of these models um, is that the energy landscape, which is described in terms of these models, is completely rugged, so rough, and one has frustration among the spins. So that is most easily seen. So for example, if I take three spins, so this spin, this spin, and that spin, and suppose, and this you will find in this random landscape, I mean, then all of those three interactions are now antiferromagnetically. Uh, and we try out uh, sort of a plus spin here, I mean, then the antiferromagnetic interaction 
uh, will dictate kind of a minus favoring spin here. Uh, if this is also antiferromagnetically, it will dictate kind of a plus spin here. But if this is now also antiferromagnetically, in fact, I mean, this spin is uh, conflicted. Okay, and it is these two features, I mean, namely um, the property I mean, that these, these landscapes I mean, are rough and you have frustration in me which are shared among all spin glass models. Now the, the fascination of these models as I described ranges far beyond physics and in fact it is the frustration and the roughness in me which make seemingly, seem, sim, seemingly simple problems like finding the ground state energy or finding the energy minimizing configuration into a hard problem. So this whole area became in fact kind of a, a playground um, for computer scientists to study complex optimization problems. And this Sherrington Kirkpatrick model is just one of the many spin glass models which you can study. So equally well, we, instead of coupling just two spins with each other, a pair interaction, we have a, a P-spin interaction and you can equally well couple them randomly. Now, just I mean, sort of to explain a bit I mean, the prefactors, J is just uh, to cope I mean, with physical units. And these prefactors, depending on N, uh, make sure I mean, that uh, the energy is extensive. Now, of particular interest, and in fact, a bit simpler is the limit P tending to infinity, which is the random energy model in which these energies I mean, which you ascribe here in this landscape become completely uncorrelated. Okay, now um, it, it, for computer scientists, as I said, I mean, this is, this is kind of a nice playground. And um, it, in fact, there are interesting results coming out of this community um, even these days where I would like to just mention Montanari's uh, result from last year I mean, where he, he in fact came up with an efficient, namely polynomial runtime algorithm uh, to study this energy minimizing problem in the case of the SK problem. Now, what I wouldn't want to do is I want to go beyond ground state questions and study the statistical mechanics, namely in particular this freezing transition where instead of the ground state energy, we study the free energy, or uh, since I don't like minus signs and one over betas, uh, the pressure or in general, the, the structure of the Gibbs state. And we, and I'm, what I'm interested in is, is what is the structure of the Gibbs state as a, as a prototype question for ergodicity breaking? Now, this is all classical story. Uh, where does quantum mechanics enter? Now, it is an appealing program um, to construct quantum algorithms to solve these complex optimization problem. And this has been done uh, in the last 10 years where people have proposed quantum annealing algorithms, adiabatic quantum computing algorithms, or quantum approximate optimization algorithms to study these, these, these spin glass problems. Now, but also from a more fundamental point of view, of course, we all know that these magnetic moments um, are ultimately quantum objects. So uh, also from this fundamental point of view, it makes sense to instead of study Ising spins, uh, to study, for example, spin one halves, which are randomly coupled. And the simplest way uh, you can do this um, is to, to take your favorite classical spin glass landscape, couple these spins still in the Z direction and enter quantum mechanics by adding a transverse field which you may choose to point in the X direction. Uh, and that's what I'm doing here. So these are the famous transverse field, transverse field models. Um, and it is these kind of models, in fact, which are of relevance uh, to study these quantum adiabatic algorithms. And there's a zoo of these models. Uh, for example, the, the quantum Sherrick and Kirkpatrick model, uh, the quantum random energy model, whatever you put here. Of course, uh, it is also of interest to couple these spins not only randomly in the Z direction, but also in other direction where you might want to study quantum Heisenberg uh, spin, spin glasses or even more posh with the uh, sachtev yekitaev model, uh, which randomly couples um, um, Majorana fermions. 
there's a plethora of motivations. Some of them, of course, I already mentioned. There's the, the question of quantum effects on the spin glass freezing transition, kind of this as a, as a toy I mean, for studying a breaking of quantum ergodicity. Um, beyond kind of the natural uh, problems uh, which come to your mind, we would be uh, problems of non-equilibrium stochastic uh, dynamics. So as for example, quantum phase transitions in trajectory space are studied by uh, Juan Garahan's group. And kind of the, seemingly the same stochastic dynamics has even a, in another represent, interpretation in another field, uh, namely genetics, and we where the easing spins and we then became, become gene sequences and the transverse field and it becomes kind of the mutation. Okay, so so much for motivations um, of studying maybe these, these models, uh, these quantum spin glasses on which I want to talk about today. And my talk um, will now focus on presenting results uh, for these transverse field models, uh, where I'll be mostly interested in, in questions of the structure of the free energy, um, this question of, of uh, breaking of quantum ergodicity, and the question of existence of quantum phase transitions. So, and in this context, um, I want to present to you two uh, results. So my first result uh, will be a, a, the question um, of um, the existence of this quantum ergodicity breaking, uh, which in the context of spin glasses uh, means actually replica symmetry breaking. And um, since I'm another math mathematician here um, working um, in these projects, uh, I in fact want to, to, to spell out a simple proof for the existence of such a replica breaking phase, um, which uh, is, is not that hard. It's as hard as the Mermin Wagner argument. Okay, but before I, I, I go to this proof, um, let me in fact uh, recap a bit more on the spin glass story uh, as was developed by Parisi in the 80s. So um, what is a characterizing feature uh, of these, these spin glasses? Well, the most important part of this freezing transition is that the, the uh, thermodynamic state space becomes excessive below the freezing transition. And this is the type of agodicity breaking which we want to describe. So in physical terms, if you cool down the system, this, the, the system just fractures into a huge number of inequivalent thermodynamic states. Now, how do you describe this type of agodicity breaking? Now, this was suggested by Parisi, as I said, in the 80s. And he pointed out to me that the way to describe um, this plethora of thermodynamic states is by an order parameter which in fact is the distribution of the replica overlap. Now, what's the replica overlap? Uh, for the replica overlap, you do a Gedanken experiment. So you take your favorite spin glass, say the SK spin glass, and you duplicate it, but keeping the randomness quenched. So keeping the randomness fixed. So we now have two copies um, of um, our SK spin glass under the same randomness. Now study the so-called replica overlap, uh, which is just the scalar product of the Z components of these spins. Now the scalar product mathematically is basically a measure of, of how far I mean, the distance of this Z configuration is away from that Z configuration. Okay, and you want to study, so this, this is now a random variable. It's random for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is, of course, the randomness, which we take to model the SK spin glass, but it's also random because of the Gibbs uh, measure, because of th thermodynamics. So um, to study the, the type of distribution, which I mean here is the distribution of this random variable at fixed external disorder with respect to the Gibbs measure in this duplicated system at temperature beta. Okay, now how would this look like in a finite system? Uh, 
to envision this, I think it's best I mean, to go back I mean, to the Curie-Weiss problem, I mean, which is of course much simpler in mean, the way you don't have competing ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic interactions, but just ferromagnetic interactions. So there we are of course um, used I mean, to the fact I mean, that uh, be below a freezing point, I mean, there are two thermal states. One thermal state describing uh, all spins kind of up or a majority up and uh, another thermal state, a majority down. Now, if you now duplicate th this, this system, I mean, you have a replica overlap involving kind of replicas of these two situations. And so you get two types uh, of, uh, of values for this, this replica overlap for the Curie-Weiss model. Now, in a spin glass, the situation is more complicated because not, there's not just two thermodynamic states, but rather there's a plethora of thermodynamic states, which in fact, as the limit n tends to infinity, goes to infinity uh, in, in the SK spin glass. And in fact, what happens in the SK spin glass, if you record this distribution here, um, in the limit n tending to infinity, this distribution uh, becomes continuous. Okay, now uh, replicating the system, maybe this kind of sounds like a mathematical trick or a trick of a theoretical physicist, which is far and remote from anything which is accessible in the laboratory. But uh, there is an order parameter of susceptibility type, which is related to this replica symmetry breaking, which is in fact just the ordinary average uh, over all pairs of spin. Um, of a spin correlation squared under the ordinary Gibbs distribution and that's accessible to you in, in the lab. Okay, now in particular, because of permutation symmetry, if you take the disorder average of this order parameter, it just becomes the expectation value, the disorder expectation value of the square um, of these correlations of a, a pair of arbitrary spins. Okay, now, so this is I mean, the story of I mean, what happens in the classical world. And now let's turn on a, quant a transversal field. Uh, what happens there? Uh, and what happens there, I've summarized here in this view graph. So this is temperature um, and external field. Uh, and for example, um, for external feed equal to zero, of course, the, the Parisi predicted completely the free energy uh, and the values for this, this order parameter. And you can show I mean, that the freezing temperature is actually in this not usual units, kind of, um, you know, the natural units. Uh, it's equal to zero here on that side. Um, and it's, it's in fact positive. Uh, on that side, okay, That's, that that is what's known from Parisi's theory uh, at b equal to zero. Now, what physicists believe, I mean, and um, when I say believe, I mean, this is kind of an extensive amount of numerical uh, and approximate work. I mean, starting in fact from 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 the eighties, is that if you now turn on the transversal field, the spin glass order. Uh, will remain at least in the gray shaded region. Okay, and uh, it is um, uh, only beyond I mean, this gray shaded region where, where spin glass order vanishes. Now, what do we know rigorously, and that's what I want to talk about, what we know rigorously is that there is replica symmetry breaking in the sense of that this order parameter is in fact strictly positive in the red shaded region, and it's equal to zero in the blue shaded region. Now, this result about uh, uh, absence of replica order uh, is derived, in fact, from showing the equality of the so-called quenched and the needs specific free energy uh, from which you can derive this result. Uh, let me give you a warning, and in particular, because I know theoretical physicists and use this as a characterizing feature also in relation with SK glasses. Um, what you see in this view in, in this uh, in this view graph below the blue dotted line is a region where rigorously one can show I mean, that quenched is not equal to annealed. Now, since this this region here extends beyond the region of where people expect 
a spin glass order, you now have two options. Either you toss out I mean, 40 years of spin glass research, uh, or you grasp with the fact I mean, that spin glass order is something else I mean, than just quench not being equal to annealed. Okay, now, now let me turn I mean, sort of uh, to, to the promised proof, and that's a proof of uh, replica symmetry breaking in the red shaded region. Now, in fact, this proof is an argument which goes back to Bray and Moore. Bray seems to be camera shy, but Michael Moore is here, and, he, and um, Eisenman, Lebowitz, and Will uh, from the 80s, who came up independently with this argument and in fact generalized it to other distributions. And the essence of this argument is that uh, there's a relation of the order parameter, in the, which in the SK glass, in the, um, uh, of course, is the, the one which I discussed in the, to the mean specific energy. Now, the mean specific energy, because of permutation invariance, is this simple expression, and this screams. Uh, of doing a Gaussian integration by parts. So if you do this Gaussian integration by parts, you are left with taking the derivative uh, of this correlation with respect to G12. Uh, and this you know, is, is given in terms of the Kubo uh, scalar product uh, minus uh, this kind of term, but that's exactly the order parameter which we're searching. So we end up in here with this box here. Now, in classical mechanics, things are simple, I mean, and this, everything commutes, uh, and therefore the Kubo scalar product reduces to A squared, which happens to be one. Uh, and from that, I mean, you can conclude, so if this is one, and since U is bounded from below by the ground state energy, uh, if beta is now sufficiently large, you can conclude that this parameter is positive. Okay, so that's the classical argument. Let's go to quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, the Duhamel scalar product is of course not that simple. And there are these quantum correlations which are more involved, but I mean, you know, there's a tool um, which the specialists might, might know from the proof uh, of uh, antiferromagnetism in, in, in the Heisenberg antiferromagnetic model which is known under Falkbruch's inequality from the PRL of 69. This estimates um, these, these quantum correlations from below in terms of actually a, a very simple function. So that's phi as a function of x, which involves a commutator, which when you calculate it happens to involve um, the, the local um, magnetic moment. Uh, and this local magnetic moment can in turn be es estimated by the usual tangent superbolicus. And then you see if you now choose B sufficiently small and in, at the same time beta large, uh, you can repeat the argument and prove uh, that there is replica symmetry breaking. Okay, so this finishes the first part where I gave you this proof before the SK model, this may be generalized to other models, me like the P-spin model. Uh, but of course, we are left I mean, with just an existence result, I mean, which is quantitative because there's this red shade shaded region, I mean, but we want to understand more about these glasses. And for that reason, um, uh, we engaged in studying hierarchical uh, quantum glasses. These are a bit simpler. And for, for us, this is a bit of a laboratory. Uh, to, to see I mean, what might happen uh, in a more complicated situation like the SK glass I mean, where no explicit formulas are available. All right, to motivate I mean, these hierarchical glasses, I mean, let me remind you I mean, that this in classical mechanics, this freezing transition is understood very well, uh, also mathematically by now. Uh, and there's an emergent hierarchical or organization characterized by this ultramatricity property of the overlaps. So a bit simplistically, it tells you uh, in, in this, this easing spin glass, like the escape glass, which group of spins freeze out at which temperature. Um, uh, so on, on which group of spins the Gibbs measure effectively concentrates. Uh, and that has a, has a tree structure. Now, what uh, Ruel and, yeah, and Derrida already in, in the 80s, uh, when studying the sort of Parisi solution, um, suggested is that one might simplify these models um, by 
um, not letting the system decide I mean, which spin I mean, freezes out, and, and that, that, that will depend on the randomness, I mean, but by a priori decomposing the groups of spins um, uh, and, and uh, fixing this, this decomposition of groups. I mean, and, and that's a bit like you know, uh, doing the Swiss thing I mean, on, on art, uh, where a reality is a complicated picture, I mean, and then you, you uh, sort things I mean, according to colors. Now, um, the way this works I mean, in mathematical terms is that uh, you, you study so-called generalized random energy models, I mean, where according to our fixed Greek group to composition, I'm assigning independent random energy models uh, to um, increasing groups of spins I mean, with a weight I mean, which then determines the model. So to emphasize I mean, this, this, this model uh, de depends really sort of on these, on these weights and all the information about the model, uh, apart from the fixed group decomposition, uh, which is encoded into sort of how big these groups are, is then encoded in these prefactors, which may be summarized in terms of a probability distribution function, uh, which, has, which, which is then is a step function according to summing up those weights. Now, as it turns out, the thermodynamics of these models is not encoded in the step function itself, but in, rather in the concave hull, which naturally has right derivatives. And the way the freezing then works is, is that uh, depending on how the, the, the concave hull is structured, um, kind of from the bottom, you have groups of spins which freeze out at a certain specified temperature. So in this, in this view graph, I mean, I've, uh, I've given you the example where I start off from four decompositions. In the end, I mean, there's a three-step repli replica symmetry breaking. Now, this is all kind of old stuff in, 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 in classical mechanics. Uh, now, what happens if I now turn on the transversal field? Uh, to our very surprise, uh, we actually we, we can determine uh, this free energy or rather the, the pressure uh, in terms of a, a closed formula, um, which uh, then is of, of Parisi type. Now, how does this closed formula work? It's a variational, remaining variational problem, which involves the classical pressure uh, where a system of, of size x times n of spins um, uh, is encoded. And the rest of the system, which is now one, the fraction 1 minus x times n spins, um, gives rise uh, to the usual paramagnetic pressure, which is there if you just consider this term. Okay, now there's an explicit expression in me for in me this, this quantity here, it's long, let me not bother with, with that. Uh, instead, in me, let me actually uh, tell you uh, the physics of that. Uh, and the predicted physics is as follows, in me that uh, now the magnetic field is in this direction and temperature in this direction. So at zero magnetic field, I mean, we have, for example, in this three-step replica symmetry breaking situation, we have three uh, freezing transitions. And now if you, for example, are in, um, in this phase down here, uh, everything is frozen. And if you now turn on the, the transversal field, there are first order phase transition, which end in quantum phase transitions, where what happens is that at this magnetic field, the last block switches to being paramagnetically. Okay. And kind of at this phase transition, the middle block switches to being paramagnetically. And at this phase transition, the last block here, the green block, switches to being paramagnetically. And in this way, you build up um, a magnetization step by step. Um, and ultimately, you are at the quantum paramagnet. Now, of course, I mean, this three-step replica symmetry breaking is not the scenario in the SK model. And in the SK model, uh, we have continuous replica symmetry breaking. This is, in fact, modeled I mean, by a smooth uh, um, a distribution function A with a smooth uh, uh, concave hull. So it's more of a situation like that. And even in this, this uh, situation, our formula predicts a phase diagram where now, instead of this first order transition, you have a second order transition. Um, 
And below this second order transition, you always have a mixed phase. Mixed, because in this variational problem, which you can solve, uh, the x uh, at that point is somewhere in between zero and one. Okay, so what does that all point out uh, or point to? I mean, well, this points to uh, a phenomenon which we dubbed quantum erasure of replica symmetry breaking. So in these hierarchical models, groups of spins decide whether to stay in the spin glass order or whether to flip jointly with a transversal field. And this gives rise to this plethora of interesting intermediate regimes. Uh, which you can then tune uh, by tuning A. Okay, so let me sum up. Um, so in, the, in this talk, I've basically talked about the stability or instability of the, of the spin glass phase under transversal magnetic field. And I gave you uh, a rigorous argument, which in fact is not so complicated, um, which rigorously establishes the existence of spin glass order also in the presence of transverse fields. Um, I've discussed I mean, what happens in these toy models I mean, where we encounter I mean, this quantum erasure of replica symmetry breaking, um, which goes along I mean, with the emergence of mixed intermediate phases characterized by reduced replica overlaps. That's something which I haven't described in detail, but which one can show and uh, alongside a transversal magnetization. And uh, all of these phase diagrams end at zero temperature and quantum phase transition. Now, of course, the big question is sort of uh, what does that mean? I mean, sort of for the SK type quantum spin glass, and we end, or for the P spin spin model. Uh, it seems to I me mean, that what people believe in these P spin models, which are probably better approximated uh, than P equal to two I mean, uh, by these hierarchical models is I mean, that there's a critical endpoint. So this line I mean, should actually in fact end. Uh, and that's something I mean, of course, I mean, which uh, we would love I mean, to show I mean, or disprove. Um, let me also end this talk and we were saying I mean, there are many, many other further interesting questions relating uh, to kind of the structure of eigenfunctions, I mean, which relates really a bit to this quantum ergodicity breaking and further um, kind of signatures of this quantum ergodicity breaking. What I what I show to you is I mean, there's a signature of, of in interesting quantum ergodicity breaking in spin glass physics um, um, on the level of thermodynamics or these replica overlaps. But, but of course, I mean, this should also show in the structure of the eigenfunctions, it should show in terms of interesting entanglement properties, we are of course, ultimately in terms of dynamical properties, which would then also relate a bit to, to maybe these, these quantum algorithms. So what I haven't talked about is really methods, um, at least for the, the second part. Uh, let me just say one word. We don't do replica calculations because it's known maybe, that they sometimes fail maybe, and lead you to the wrong results. I mean, what we really do is, is a combination of spectral analysis, quantum statistical mechanics, and large deviation results. But that's kind of all maybe, sort of uh, in the witch's kitchen. Uh, if you are interested uh, into, in, in these details, please consult maybe, sort of uh, these references. And I'm also happy to answer any questions and discuss with you later. Great, so thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Uh, we have a few minutes for some questions. So if you have any questions, just write them on Slack. And if not, in the meantime, I, I'm a bit curious about these methods that you were mentioning at the end, these mathematical methods behind the, the proofs. So could you give like some small intuition from the witch kitchen or? Ah, okay. So see, we somehow quantum spin glasses. Um, so what, what physicists usually do, and this will be familiar with the audience, uh, is they represent the partition function and replicated versions of the partition function in terms of path integrals. Um, and it is then kind of these replica calculations in the path integrals and further static approximations in the, which, which they do to, to determine approximately these phase diagrams. Now, we have reasons to believe in me that some of that actually is not valid. Um, and instead what we do um, is we really treat in me these, these large random matrices uh, 
as a random matrix and do spectral analysis, but on the level of statistical mechanics. So for example, the usual Golden Thompson, uh, you know, the usual piles Bogoliubov inequalities and, and um, in these hierarchical classes and you, you can basically study the large excursion onto which the Gibbs measure eventually settles. And basically what you have to prove is, is that these excursions don't connect here by quantum tunneling. And that, that's the witch's kitchen. I see, thanks a lot. So uh, I, I see there's another question coming on Slack, but uh, I guess it's better if we just move the discussion uh, to the round table. So please, I encourage everyone to join the round, the round table discussion that you can find at Meet Anyway or at uh, Z Reality Platform. And to conclude this session, let me just thank again both uh, speakers of the session. And let me remind the participants, well, the, the, the audience, that there is, uh, I mean, after this roundtable discussion, there's uh, some activity related to the Munich Quantum Valley. And also after that, the, uh, the group photo, uh, you know, of the conference will take place. So please check the, the agenda of the conference and join these activities. And see you now at the roundtable discussion. Great, sorry for the.